everybody. We got a great one today. And usually I'd say for a change, but this one's Dahlia Lithwick and hers are always great. If you're a regular listener to the Al Franken podcast, you've no doubt heard Dahlia a number of times before. Dahlia is my go-to on the Supreme Court. She writes about the court for, for Slate, and she's brilliant and very funny, and we, we like each other. Usually, I have Dahlia on if there's uh, you know something big happening at the court, like a nomination or... Um, Every year at the end of the Supreme Court term, Dahlia will review all the decisions made by the court, which was very, very ugly this year. Uh, But this one is uh, unique in in two ways. First of all, Dahlia has a book out, Lady Justice, which Peter and I call Lady Justice because we think Jerry Lewis is funny. We we really think he's funny. And actually, so does Dahlia. Uh, The book isn't funny so much as it's uh, compelling and inspiring because it tells about these women lawyers who each do and have done extraordinary things and uh, really important things at important times. We're talking about Sally Yates standing up to the Trump administration uh, on the Muslim ban, uh, being fired as uh, acting attorney general because she stood up and said, this uh, is unconstitutional. All of these uh, women in this book, all these women lawyers, are brilliant, courageous women who stand up at critical junctures and stand up for people who are getting crapped on by powerful forces, and they win. They win. So that's the first distinction about this one with Dahlia. This is an important one, although they've been all important. That's not the distinction. This one's about a great book. The other is that we're in the studio together in this. Usually I do these from an office in my home, and my guest is in their home. Most of my guests are interviewed on other podcasts or even have a podcast like Dahlia does. She she has a podcast called Amicus. So she's all set up at home or wherever home is. She sometimes is, she bounces around between like Toronto and New York and, uh, and other places. But this one we did for the first time in the studio. Big mistake. Seems we have too much fun when we're in the same room. So I have to apologize in in this one if we get off on on tangents. And if we laugh in between horribly uh, deadly serious topics. And I'm afraid I'm a bad influence. Dahlia is a very serious, extremely respected legal scholar uh, as you know, in the Senate, I was on the Judiciary Committee. I'm not a lawyer, but I I played one in a sketch. But I started out I started out in comedy, and I've, I've returned to it currently on the only former U.S. Senator currently on tour tour. And I'm afraid that sometimes my response to uh, dark things is dark humor, and sometimes I drag Dahlia along with me. But that's my fault. It's my fault. The real point of all of this is how these women lawyers that Dahlia writes about are astounding women who are tough, brilliant, determined, and motivated to do great things that somebody needed to do on behalf of other people, and they did them. They did them. And the result is lady justice. Before we go to Dahlia, I just want to say a word about what's going on in what I call the case of the purloined classified documents. Uh, Last week in my monologue, before my uh, conversation uh, with uh, Paul Krugman, I took a little risk and made a prediction about where this this matter is going. And I went out on a a bit of a limb. The uh, Trump's team strategy has uh, been abetted by Judge Aileen Cannon, the Trump-appointed district court judge in in Florida, who made a number of rulings that dovetailed nicely with Trump's team strategy of uh, dragging this thing out. Now, part of that was insisting on a special master to go through the documents. Now, each team, the Justice Department and the Trump team, were to propose candidates for that job. And of course, the Justice Department named two eminently uh, qualified federal judges to do the job. The Trump team proposed one guy who's never been a judge and is just a partisan political hack and a federal judge, Raymond J. Deary, a, a Reagan appointee. 
Well, everyone who knows Judge Deary said, this guy is great. Uh, I guess the Trump team thought they just they had to suggest one credible guy. So DOJ said, sure, let's go with Judge Deary. So last week in the monologue, I laid out all the moves that uh, the DOJ might take in terms of appealing to the 11th Circuit Court, which is a, a majority Trump court, and the delays that that couldn't tell. But this is where I went out on a limb. I said in my monologue, I said, Judge Deary is going to deal with this, he's going to deal with it correctly and quickly. Well, holy crap, what, what's happened since is just great. See, at, at one point, Trump made public statements claiming that he had declassified some of the seized records, saying that the Justice Department had no case against him for illegally retaining sensitive government material, but neither he nor his lawyers have made those assertions in court or in court papers where they could face penalties for lying, like, you know, prison. So Judge Deering, at this Tuesday's hearing, asked the Trump legal team whether or not Trump had declassified these documents. And the Trump team said, well, we're not going to say one way or or another, because if he's indicted, that may be part of our defense. And we want to wait till that happens (laughs) to, to tell you. And Judge Deering says, This is a quote. My view is you can't have your cake and eat it too, meaning, okay, you you know, you're free not to tell me one way or another whether your client declassified these materials, but if you don't, I'm just going to deem them classified. And he he said, I I probably won't even, I don't need to review them then. Finally, the Trump team has met a real judge, and I, I was right, and they are fucked. And they're fucked because Trump is lying. And this is going to happen fast. Okay, on to Lady Justice. You're going to love this one with Dahlia Lithwick, as usual. Dahlia Lithwick is with me for the, um, I don't know, we don't keep track, you know. Of how many times you've been on. No, you used to keep track because you were always pitting me against the next mostest person to try to make me competitive. Do you remember? You'd be like, oh, such and such has been yeah, but I lost one track. time more than you. I lost you track. You me very anxious. Did I ever tell you the story about when I won the silent retreat? There was a silent yoga retreat. I won it. Just so you know how competitive I am. I want to win Al Franken really bad. You're, you're, I think you're lapping, everyone. Thank you. Okay, mm-hmm. I haven't had Mark Elias on in a long time. <laughs> I think he was the one. I think he's my yeah, competitor. Yeah, okay. So this book, Lady Justice, <laughs> but I think Peter does it better. Peter? Lady Justice. The high, the high. <laughs> oh, my, he might be better than you. He's better than me. Oh, okay. Watch your back, man. Lady Justice. So uh, a great book. I, I uh, made the mistake, though, of reading it as soon as I got it. Like about five weeks ago or something like that? Four weeks ago? I think you, you you really literally got like the third or fourth book. So it was probably, you called me about it two weeks ago and mm-hmm. you were the first person who had read it. Yeah. Including my parents who <laughs> have not yet read it. Well, I probably got it sooner because you had to go on, you didn't have to go on their show. <laughs> 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 but what it does is, I'll tell, I'll say what the book is. It talks about a lot of lady lawyers <laughs> Who do unbelievable things. They're one after another are just great. Uh, and I didn't know, uh, know about hardly any of them. Sally Yates, uh, Benita Gupta, I, I know. I know her. She was uh, head of civil rights while I was there. Maybe I know a couple of the others. But Pauly, I had never heard of Pauly Murray. And uh, amazing. Tell them about this woman. Well, tell, tell our folks. Well, the first thing I would say about Polly Murray is that everybody should run out and watch the documentary. My name is Polly Murray, mm-hmm. which came out, I think, last year. I think it premiered at Sundance. And everybody who watched it had the same reaction that you did, which is, how the hell have I never heard of this person? And for me, um, you know, who went to law school and never learned about Polly Murray, It's just says so much about who gets famous and who doesn't. 
So in a nutshell, Polly Murray, who probably today would want to go by they, uh, because was very, very convinced that she was a man in a woman's body and spent really much of her life trying to get people to acknowledge that, which it was too soon. But in that way, in every other, Polly Murray was like 10 steps ahead of the civil rights movement. So she, and she's uh, African-American. African-American woman born in the South, uh, can't get into her first college of choice because she's black, can't get into her first law school of choice because a woman, you know, throughout her lifetime has doors slammed but is also 10 steps ahead of history. So she refuses to go to the back of a bus in Virginia long before Rosa Parks does. She's uh, doing sit-ins at l lunch counters long before anyone else is. She actually writes as uh, a law school paper an argument that becomes the spine of the briefing in Brown v. Board to desegregate the schools. That, Except to me, was the most amazing thing. Well, the most amazing thing is that they used her work, yes. didn't credit her, no, that's not amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and that years later, they're like, oh, by the way, this is your work. And and she, for me, becomes really emblematic. And by the way, like, no shrinking violet writes to Richard Nixon and says, I hear you're looking for the first woman Supreme Court justice. Uh, that should be me. So she's not, you know, she's, she's not shy. Eleanor Roosevelt's pen pal. Like, she's everywhere and history's forgotten her. Uh, she was the only woman in her class at Howard University in 1944 and graduated first in her class. Yes. Okay. Her book, State Laws on Race and Color, was described by Thurgood Marshall as the Bible of Brown v. Board. Yep. She puts together this compendium. It was supposed to be this tiny <laughs> compendium <laughs> that becomes an amalgamation of, of, of what's going on in all the states, and then he uses it. But history's forgotten her. Here's a case that she wrote the brief in. She co-wrote the brief in White v. Crook, which led to the demise of the all-white, all-male jury system in Alabama. Yeah. Okay. Now, an all-white, all-male jury. I, I actually, I guess when I read it, I went, oh, yeah, of course, I guess, of course, of course. <laughs> but I'm thinking like, okay, what year was that? What year was that? I Evidently, Dahlia doesn't do the whole Hold on, I've got it. I've got it. Wait. Wait a minute. No, I've got it. White v. Crook in 1966. 19, okay, 1966. so in other words, they're all white, all male juries in, in Alabama. Alabama until 1966. And, gee, I wonder if, um, if uh, black people got equal justice in Alabama. It, it's one of those things where... Gee, I wonder if black <laughs> women... <laughs> wow, wow, wow. And, you know, man, there's no systemic racism in our in history. Alabama, and not in Alabama. <laughs> not in Alabama. Jeff Sessions. Um, no, I, here's Jeff the Sessions, thing about yeah. Polly Murray, if I may. I feel like her erasure, or maybe their erasure from constitutional history is one of the reasons I wanted to write this book, right? Because you started with like, who are these people? Haven't I heard of them? Why haven't That's I heard right. of them? And my question is, why haven't we all heard of Polly Murray? And one of the differences between what happens in Brown v. Board, where she's not credited with all the work she does and the theorizing she does about the mm -hmm. 14th Amendment, is that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she writes uh, the brief in uh, what becomes like her, one of her signal, like the first cases that she writes using the 14th Amendment to create gender equality, she actually puts Polly Murray's name on the brief in order to sort of signal, I see you, I know the work you did, we are borrowing from your work. And in a way, I sort of want to use it as slightly emblematic of being a little bit more way, And you think that's evidence that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a class act? Well, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just going to leave that there. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me go through some of these. Sally Yates, who I, I also know, and she, I was in that hearing where she made Demolished Cruz. Demolished Ted Cruz. Oh, can you tell about that? Well, just that Ted Cruz was, man, she was, this was after she'd already been summarily uh, 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 fired. I think that they tried to fire her by text or email, right, after she refused to enforce the Muslim ban. And then there was a hearing to kind of go over it. And Ted Cruz tried to humiliate her by mansplaining the law to her. And she just very calmly reframed it and explained that he didn't know what he was talking about. But it was just another one of those moments where. 
her command of the law was so extraordinary and he thought he was getting this gotcha viral moment. And she just, so oddly for him, he was being a dick yeah. when she did it. So, you know, sometimes if you like you, you say something and someone kind of contradicts you or tops you, it's not so bad. But if you're being a dick yeah. on the way and Ted sometimes uh, is a dick. Have we talked about the fact that he was my college debate opponent, that I've known him since no. college? I know talked? you were a college debater. I've been debater. on the show 8,000 times and we've never talked about this? Well. Take that, Mark Elias. <laughs> so, uh, how was that? How was it? It was exactly as you would imagine. <laughs> He's an amazing dick. Um, <laughs> you know who Michael Carvin is? Yeah. Okay, Michael Carvin, also a huge dick. Okay, so after they get rid of, uh, after Shelby County and they lose preclearance. So this is uh, in 13. We're having hearings on rewriting it uh, so that we can. The Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act, right. In, in a way that we can get preclearance back. And of course, uh, Carvin is there testifying <laughs> not to do that. And I'm trying to figure out, th this Ted hasn't been there long. I'm saying, what kind of dick is this guy? I just can't figure out, is he a Texas dick? Uh, is he just a Republican dick? What kind of dick is he? And so Carvin is sorry, and, and, and it gets to Ted and he says to Carvin, uh, you and I go way back. I make you two promises. I will tell no tales. And I go, Oh, he's a Harvard dick. <laughs> Harvard I, Law. Oh, was, I Princeton. shall tell no tales. <laughs> No, it was Harvard. Harvard, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Harvard. You know, well, I you mean, know what he did the first week of Harvard Law. Do you know this? I don't know. He puts up a flyer. He wants to put together like this great study group that he wants to be in. And he puts on the flyer at the bottom, no minor ivies. Oh. If you put me on a, on a desert island for a hundred years and said, you've got to think of something to tell your new classmates the First week of Harvard Law, that you are the biggest dick in the world, I could not think of anything better than no minor Ivies. Yeah. Because major Ivies, of course, yeah, of are course. Yale, Princeton, and Harvard. I mean. <laughs> and he didn't want anybody from Columbia. <laughs> I, I'll tell <laughs> Or no dare I say, not even an Ivy. No. Oh. No, <laughs> I'm an enormous dick. Sorry, we're off our subject. We're working through. <laughs> we're working through our issues. We are working through our issues. Uh, okay. Okay. At least keep going. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> so Sally Yates, of course, quits <laughs> when the Muslim. No, she fired. She's fired. She refuses. Oh, that's right. 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 She refuses right. to she, enforce it. She right. sends out a memo that says. This both violates religious is, liberty and it violates due process. And they're like, and bye bye. <laughs> and bye bye. Send her on her way. That's right. She didn't want to. No. Uh, quit. So, and, uh, but she, I kind of wanted her to be, when Biden, before Biden, when he said it was going to be a woman, I thought Sally Yates had been a good veep. Yeah. I mean, w one interesting theme of this book is that people like Stacey Abrams, who were expressly asked if they wanted to be the veep, were like, no, I'm just going to keep doing my work. Sally Yates is very much in that. She just is doing her work. Uh, well, anyway, so I, I, this is a quote from the book I wrote down, Don McGahn. Why does it matter to DOJ if one White House official lies to another White House official? This is about Flynn. Yeah. Lying to uh, to Pence, yeah, about talking to the Russian ambassador, right? Right. This is at the very beginning when he's talking. Now, to Don Kennedy. McGahn is the White House Counsel, and he's wondering why it matters <laughs> to the Department of Justice if one White House official lies to another White House official, and well, how about if you're the National Security Advisor, you're kind of compromised. W one of the things that. I love about the Sally Yates chapter 
is, and I, I guess I should say the arc of this book is like we start with Sally Yates, who just is the very first person who says, oh, hell no. And then we sort of end with, you know, Stacey Abrams and these huge armies of women organizers. And I like that move from like, you know, the single savior and we all had the mugs and the, you know, tote bags of Sally Yates, but then this army of black and brown women who actually like recaptured so the So there Senate. was some purpose to the way you organized There was, the believe it or not, some architecture involved here, but Sally Yates, I love because it shows the contempt that the Trump administration hold her in, that she's in White House counsel's office trying to talk to Don McGahn, trying to say, like, I think Flynn is compromised. I think we're all compromised with the Russians. Maybe it's bad if Mike Pence is passing on lies and saying them on national TV. And all the while, they're producing the travel ban, the Muslim ban, and no one tells her. No one tells the acting attorney general of the United States. She finds out she leaves McGann's office. She <laughs> gets into a cab to go to the airport. And she finds out on her phone from a New York Times news alert that they forgot to tell her. That's how they treated her. Somebody who was like a lifer at the Justice Department. And they didn't think to tell her. And who's the acting attorney yeah. general? <laughs> yeah. that you, don't, don't forget that part. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they ban these people flying in. And um, that goes to uh, Becca Heller. Who is like start very young? Yeah, she's incredibly, incredibly young, and she's uh, she's a very uh, fun chapter because she just says what she thinks, and she's very um, clear. Uh, in other words, she says fuck a lot, and it's it's great fun to interview. You, her. you describe her as a ferocious foul mouth. <laughs> so she's she's you know a very young lawyer. She has while she's in law school founded IRAP, which is the International Refugee Assistance Project. And they were working to help refugees who can't get anybody to let them in. Statistically speaking, if you have an attorney, <laughs> your chances of uh, success go up exponentially. So she's been linking refugees up with lawyers, kind of quietly beavering away and then builds this out after law school so that young law students are working it with prestigious firms in order to do this. It's an amazing model that she scales up. And she's one of the first people who knows that the travel ban is coming. And she's got all these refugees <laughs> who are counting on entry uh, into the United States because they've got the uh, required immigration documents. And she really is one of the people who sent up a flare in the minutes and hours before the travel then goes into effect, essentially saying not just to her army of lawyers, but pro boat no lawyers across the country, show up at an airport, mm -hmm. just show up and help because these people are getting off planes. When the plane took off, they were allowed entry and the plane landed and they are not allowed entry. And I use her partly because she's young and she's kind of like, how is this happening to me? I'm on TV. I'm in a hoodie and ripped jeans. But also because it was so incredible the way all these lawyers just stepped up. They just like drove to their local airports and they just sat down at baggage claim and started, you know, signing up clients. And for me, that that happened in the first week of the Trump era is so emblematic of what law can do and what lawyers can do if you're sort of purposive, like they showed up and people, my God, Al, people, people standing outside SFO yelling, let the lawyers in, let the lawyers in. And I was just like, no, but you hate us. <laughs> you hate lawyers, America. We're but like, Amer but uh, what you're saying is Americans showed up. American people, show people showed, up. showed up and it was an amazing moment and we forget it, right? And we, we're cynical. you know, in the, it, as a senator, I was fighting for people that were coming in who were coming to Minnesota. To Minnesota, and there yeah. were a lot, right? Yeah, right. and uh, from Somalia yeah. and, and other other places. God damn it. Those, they're awful. That Trump. Oof. Did you know that he was bad? <laughs> okay. He's a dick, too. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> they gave up, right? Uh, they, or they, they let started letting these people in and went to court, right? And then, then it went through the uh, courts. And yeah, the courts we, there said, were three no, iterations of the Muslim yeah, yeah. ban, each one watered down. Right. They ultimately won at the Supreme Court. Right. Uh, but I think this was also an example of just amazing, amazing years-long lawyering by armies of lawyers that we kind of didn't clock. The great thing about this is lawyers are heroes in this book. But they're not just lawyers. They're lady lawyers. That is what I'm told. Yeah. 
Okay, let's let's go to now. You lived in Charlottesville. This is a deeply for a serious while. book, people. <laughs> yes, I did. I lived in Charlottesville for seventeen years. Look, uh, if you don't know me, the seriousness and laughs go hand in hand. The worse, the better. <laughs> That's why Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Known for his support. No, no, I mean, he was a great comedian. He was a great comedian. I meant like. Yeah, no, no, I'm with you. You know, Hitler jokes. Or, <laughs> I meant the worse the better. Right? That's what I'm saying. Peter, this is why we don't do these in person, just FYI. <laughs> never, <laughs> never again. This is going to be a bitch of an edit. Oh, uh, no, no. This will be a fun. Edit. Okay. It'll be a long one, though. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Robbie Kaplan. Yeah. And you lived in Charlottesville for 17 years. And were you there then yes. when this happened? Yes. We, we were that night. Speaking of Nazis, huh? Speaking of nice segue. <laughs> Speaking of Nazis. Speaking of Nazis, there were a lot of, um, there, uh, not a lot, but there were some good people on both sides. I always try to, like, just like, maybe somebody sent somebody, you know, like, can you go with your uncle to Charlottesville? Because I'm afraid he's going to kill somebody. And just keep an eye on him so he doesn't do that. And that kid, that he was nephew, a good person. was a good person. Yeah. That's what Trump meant. I think that's <laughs> The minder for the infirm, crazy yeah. uncle. Yeah. Yeah. But make sure he doesn't kill somebody. That guy probably didn't go on trial, though. Well, yeah. be moral. Make sure he doesn't kill somebody. <laughs> okay. okay. And another. No. Okay, mama. Anyway. <laughs> Um, Charlottesville, what do you want to talk about? Uh, well, Robbie, uh, Robbie Kaplan's uh, job. So basically, we all know what happened. These these Nazis <laughs> uh, come with the torches and, you know, what are they chanting? They're chanting, uh, not kill the Blood Jews. and soil. Blood, <laughs> Blood and soil. They might as well it's be. It's Nazi for kill the Jews. It's Nazi the for kill the Jews. But it's basically that shit, right? It's it, worse. It, There's, it, it, it was crazy. It's right. I, nail on the head. Yeah. Basically, they said, well, let's be violent so, so, in the head yes. of time, right? They're putting it and, and she proves this, right? Yeah. So, so a couple things just to lash it back to sort of the themes of the book. Trump has emboldened all this, right? Like Trump, Richard Spencer, who's the like head organizer of this stuff, is the one who's doing rallies after Trump is elected and these like white supremacist. He's saying, you know, hail Trump. You know, this is going to be the beginning of the advent of, you know, white male primacy reclaiming itself in America. And that summer, Charlottesville kind of becomes like the Disneyland for all the Nazis and white supremacists. So they came first the, there was a torch march that spring. Then the KKK shows up and protests in Charlottesville. It was like that scene in Blazing Saddles, you know, where like the Nazis and the bikers and the Klansmen are all like <laughs> lined up. Do you remember? It was like that. That was the whole summer. And by the time August 11th and 12th roll around. It's not a big town. It's either. a tiny little town. <laughs> it's a tiny little college town in central Virginia. It's a very blue town in a purple state that really prides itself on, you know, kind of coming around on racial justice and inequality. But it's still a town that like. But and now one of the issues is the statue of Robert E. Lee. Yes, there's there's Confederate war statues that the town had after much anguish decided to take down of, of war heroes. And so for the white supremacists, this becomes at least pretextually the cause, right? They're erasing our history. They, they, they want to, you know, paper over the, the great valiant efforts of the South. And the thing that, that they forget is that those statues are not, in fact, Civil War monuments. They go up. 1930s. In the 1930s. Yeah. They, in a whole rush of, you know, post reconstruction, when they start putting up Civil War monuments, mostly just to get black neighborhoods to collapse, right? So that they had just said, you know, Vinegar Hill was this thriving black neighborhood in Charlottesville. And so at the time, the town elders were like, let's pop up some Confederate war monuments here in order to, you know, displace them. That was the purpose of them. They're not there to celebrate the war among the states. So it becomes this huge cause celebre around the country that they're tearing down these monuments. And this becomes the cause for all these white supremacists, Nazis, you know, Holocaust deniers to show up and terrorize the town. And they keep claiming free speech, free speech, right? This is right. Skokie, Illinois. This is no different from the Nazis. Marching Skokie in. was a, a Supreme Court decision yeah. saying that you have free speech, even if it's reprehensible. Even you if you're a Nazi, it. you can yeah, speak. Yeah. But that was a peaceful march in Illinois. Right. This, says Robbie Kaplan, was 
meticulously planned on Discord in chats, which were all disclosed to Robbie mm-hmm. Kaplan and her team. This was an invasion. They had columns in their in their chats that were like weapons, <laughs> what to wear, you know, w- how to provoke uh, Antifa. This wasn't a free speech well, spontaneous it was, rally. We're going to crack heads. We're yes. going to be fine. I mean, they, yes. they, that was that, the purpose. Yeah, that which made it easier for her to prove. <laughs> right, right. And so they got this huge tranche of. of yeah. They still don't know, by the way, how they got it. This huge tranche of chats. And so she and Karen Dunn, another amazing woman lawyer, basically say if the John Ashcroft Justice Department were actually doing civil rights enforcement, they would have done this. They did not. We will step in. And so they filed in 2017 right after And And, and a, a young woman was killed. Heather Heyer was hit yeah. by a car and killed by James By Field. a guy who deliberately drove through Smashed the crowd. Smashed into her. And hurt other people very seriously. Marcus Martin, you know, uh, badly his. injured a whole bunch of um, her plaintiffs. So she essentially says, I'm going to do two crazy things. One, I'm going to dust, dust off the KKK Act, which is literally a hundred year old statute that had been drafted because the Klan was terrorizing people in the South. And she dusts that off. And then she brings this civil case where they get everyone, you know, Chris Cantwell, Richard Spencer, you know, all of these unbelievable groups, and they get them all, 24 defendants. It takes forever because each of these defendants keeps dropping his cell phone in the toilet and brings them to trial this last fall in Charlottesville and wins like a huge judgment against them. And one of the reasons I was really obsessed with this is A, it took four years. B, it didn't get the attention I think it should have gotten. I mean, this was a huge judgment that, by the way, is a template for going after January 6th, rioters who also say they have free speech rights. But it's also just for me an example of so many themes in the book, which is like Robbie looking around. She's just left Paul Weiss. She started her own firm. That's a law firm. Big fancy white shoe firm. She started her own firm. She looks around the day after Trump says his good people on both sides thing and is like, well, someone better sue the Nazis. And she did it. And and a lot of them got jail time, too, right? For different things. I mean, uh, 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 James Field, who was driving the car, is in jail for the rest of his life. But some of these guys, like Chris Cantwell... um were incarcerated for other things. But this was money damages that goes right into the pockets, if she can collect, of these plaintiffs whose lives were ruined. And maybe more importantly, and like it's a serious point, we're sitting here and we've already forgotten all this shit. This is a historical record of what happened. And it's so important to not just get the cash judgment, but to literally litigate. This is what you did. This is what you wanted to do. Well, that's why this book is so important because it's about these women who are so just fucking do it. Just fucking do it. They fucking do it. Bridget should have been the subtitle. Yep. Bridget, um, uh, how do you pronounce it? Amiri. Who you say looks... A lot like if Audrey Hepburn had been a lawyer. <laughs> she's a, she's just petite. She was a dancer. She does not look like the Tasmanian devil, but then you get her in a court. But then she's vicious. She's, she's not vicious. She's just incredibly effective. Right. And you'd forgotten this, didn't you? You repressed this memory of that they were not letting migrant teens get abortions. No, I did not you did repress, not repress them. <laughs> I remember that. And I remember Kavanaugh. Yes. Peace in this. I really do. And this was him auditioning. Mm-hmm. To be a Supreme Court justice. And let's see. I mean, I read just read the book, so it's not fair. Uh, but basically, no, I remember this because I remember in the hearings. I watched those hearings. I wasn't there. And I, it drove me nuts watching those hearings, by the way, because uh, I don't think our questioning was good. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's this teenage refugee who uh, wants to get an abortion. Yeah, she's pregnant. She is in a shelter, a government-operated uh, or government-funded shelter in, in Texas. And she's entitled? She's entitled. She has gone through the painstaking, it is not easy in Texas for a teenager uh, to get an abortion. She, she, The judge has greenlit it, and then the shelter simply will not open the door and let her. And this guy, Scott Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> this guy, Scott Lloyd, who, by the way, also had a part in the child separation Yes, stuff. he did. Awful, awful, awful mm-hmm. man. And one of the things I remembered from this is that he kept records yes. of these um, these girls of their menstrual cycles. Yes, he did. 
Tell them about that for a second. This is so sick. I mean, this is a person who's in charge of all the refugees, and he is using it because he believes that life begins at conception. So he is using his copious government powers to keep teenage girls in shelters from having abortions. That's what that's what he's focused on. And as the book kind of tells the story, he's literally intervening personally. This is like... <laughs> It's not Mengele exactly, but it, it is so sick. Well, it's Handmaid's Tale. I it's think Handmaid's that's what Tale. it is. Handmaid's Tale. There you go. I think it's this idea <laughs> that you can force these women to give birth. She, she as we said, the, the judge had said, you are allowed to go and terminate the pregnancy. Instead, they took her to a crisis pregnancy center, which are those fake clinics mm -hmm. where they pretend that they're giving you services, but in fact, they're counseling you. They called her parents, which was an absolute violation of her confidentiality. And, you know, this part of the reason this case is so shocking is that it's going up and down through the courts, right? It ends up in front They're of They're delaying it because exactly. at a certain point. Exactly. The yeah. clock is ticking and they just yes. want to run out the clock because at some point in Texas, she cannot terminate. And as you said, this case eventually ends up in front of the D.C. Circuit, in front of Brett Kavanaugh. And he's doing his like reasonable man chin stroking performance where he's like, I think we should get her, you know, a guardian ad litem. I think we need to get her wouldn't it, a wouldn't sponsor. Wouldn't it be better for her to get advice? If she had guardian, a sponsor help and she already had a guardian ad litem, <laughs> she had lawyers. And he's sitting there literally saying, if we just take a couple more weeks and find a sponsor, everybody wins. And Patricia uh, Millett, who was the judge uh, in that case who dissented, just was like, Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. What are you doing? And as you said, this turns out to be his audition because the opinion he writes, he's not on any Trump shortlist for a, a Supreme Court gig, right? Trump has already shown us several. And he's writing suddenly this like fiery, you know, abortion upon demand, all this language that is just like absolutely. And what a surprise word. that he ended up. He ends up on the list. No, not not only on the list, but ends up um, overturning Roe. Yeah. <laughs> what a surprise. Yeah. Even though. He, he told us. He promised us. Stare decisis. Well, he said it was uh, precedent upon, upon precedent. precedent. It was a precedent sandwich. But Casey was a precedent on a precedent. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, moving on. What was the name of your book again? <laughs> Lady! Justice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, basically, the, finally, this young, this teenager gets the abortion. Right. But w was he in the minority in that, Kavanaugh? He was in the majority on the three-judge opinion that was, was going to stop the clock. And then it went back to the D.C. Circuit, to the whole court en banc. Oh, I and see. And they reversed it. And so, then the issue was that... The administration tried to get her like disbarred and tried to like besmirch her reputation oh that's right she yeah. had to go through shit yeah no they, they 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 didn't like the fact that she didn't tell them that the shelter had arranged for the procedure she felt that she just felt like the minute the court said do it they had already been stutter stepping along she was right up against the deadline so they and got she spent the like six months in this process of worrying about whether she was gonna well i'm trying to remember it was it was a couple of weeks but she was up mm. against the she was definitely up against what the texas at which point they would have not allowed it and so they got her the procedure and then the lawyers in the justice department tried to get bridget amiri sanctioned uh which doesn't seem like a lot Unless you are a lawyer, but the idea of yeah. being sanctioned for serving your client and effectuating that abortion was another one of those. Just you know, we're we're just now seeing the news about what Bill Barr was doing. <laughs> you know what? Holy and I mackerel. just want to say the use of the Justice Department to go after people who were just doing their freaking jobs. The scope of that is unbelievable. I mean, I know that Bill Barr is on a like nationwide redemption tour and is now, you know, saying that Trump should <laughs> probably shouldn't steal classified nuclear documents. <laughs> but the idea that the DOJ was a party to this is just beyond 
belief. Anyway, so they tried to go after Bridget Amiri's license. Yes. Well, she's a hero. These are all, these women are all just, it's so inspiring, the book. Vanita Gupta, who I knew when she was head of the Civil Rights Division, and she testified. And also, I called her a couple times for help on something. Her, the, the first thing you talk about is Tulia. Is that how you pronounce? Tulia. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, this is just how she starts her career. Uh, she literally just is, you know, there's this shocking, shocking injustice in Tulia, Texas, where they do. Texas again. Yes, Texas. Alabama, Texas, and Florida. Um, okay. They, they do what is purportedly this huge uh, drug sting that turns out to be just one completely corrupt cop and sweeps up you know, all the people of color in town. And the whole thing is shocking. And it's kind of working its way through the system. They're all going to go to jail forever. And Vanita finds out about it. She just flies down. This is starting to be the theme, right? She just flies down and she essentially re-litigates on their behalf so that she can get them, not just so that she can get them all uh, exculpated, but that, that it turns into one of the landmark cases that shows the whole country about racialized policing. And it becomes, you know, it, it, it gets picked up around the country and eventually Tulia has to apologize and, and how long did these people serve I'm in jail to remember, it's you, like four years yeah or no something? I mean it was uh, uh undercover drug st- sting in Tulia Texas in 1999 <laughs> local cops arrested and convicted 12 percent <laughs> of the entire town's black population <laughs> and it's all the here wait for it the uncorroborated testimony of one cop who already had like this history of using racist language and <laughs> it's hilarious. 46 <laughs> people <laughs> of whom 40 are black were arrested and the local media, the, the headline in the Tulia Herald wrote that day, quote, Tulia's streets cleared of garbage. <gasps> That's the headline. And, you know, needless to say, this is, this is. Now a- that wasn't like. They had had a garbage strike and just that happened to be that day and you're not doing like pulling like what Republicans do. <laughs> Here, I'm just going to I'm just going to read for one little second okay. for those of us who, who, who don't yet believe in racialized policing. Quote, the arresting officer wore no wire. He had no backup testifying at trial. He claimed to have recorded the names, dates and other pertinent facts about his mass of drug buys by writing all the relevant information on his leg. Was he wearing shorts? I mean, is this like a, these police have shorts? Is he like a guy who rides a bike in shorts or something? Uh, <laughs> How does that work? By the, end of, by the end of this total shit show, two years, right? She, two years, she's beavering away on this case. Finally, Rick Perry had to give pardons to almost all the defendants. And then, because she's badass... Vanita helps to negotiate this six million dollar settlement. Then, because she's a badass, well, yeah, she writes a, a law review article essentially saying, "Ignore the New York Times headlines and all the fanfare. This is not a win because the system is so freaking broken that the fact that we extracted this handful of defendants mm-hmm. from you know unbelievable prison time, like the whole system is broken." And that kind of vaults. How old is she at this? She's 26 when she started. (laughs) Okay. I think she goes to Walmart and gets some suitcases when she realizes she needs to go to get some, some, she needs to bring the files home. Oh, the phone. Right. But I I just think, again, this is just, you know, I think that she's not sitting around workshopping this, you know, with 40 other lawyers. She's just like, this is, this is what we're going to do now. And I think that for me, her chapter, two things happen in her chapter that I think are kind of, I hate the word inflection points, hate people who use the word inflection points, but going to say it, inflection points. It means something. It, 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 okay, go ahead. We'll just live with it. Um, but I think she, two things happen. One is that she goes from being this person who is like at the ACLU, like doing all this work suing the government, suing the government. And then she goes and works for Eric Holder, like you said. Like, she actually becomes an insider at the Justice Department. And that's super interesting. That She's like an activist and then boom. She, yeah. And, and, and now she's doing policy. But the other thing that I really love about Vanita 
is that for me, this chapter is the one where you realize like you can keep winning lawsuits and win and win and win. And unless you fix systems, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. And so she becomes this person who does, you know, she goes on to the leadership conference and she's just organizing coalitions. And she realizes that all the lawsuits in the world can't fix things. And she becomes a person who just devotes like her four years at the Trump administration and now her years um, under Merrick Garland to fixing, you know, whether it's in, not in the Trump administration, of course, but in the I- I'm sorry, Obama in, in the Obama administration. And that's where she's. Uh, yes. Has civil rights. And also she works with police departments on consent <laughs> decrees. Yes. And consent decrees are like after Ferguson, they had to do a consent decree, which is, okay, we're going to be supervised by DOJ and we're going to fix this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And a lot of departments, police departments enter into consent decrees. Guess who gets rid of them? Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions. Yeah. It's, it's, there's no oversight. There is no oversight. And in fact, one of the things they knock her for, I mean, you know, in her confirmation hearings, when when um, she's appointed to the Merrick Garland, she's number three now in right. Merrick Garland's DOJ, and they're going after her for being anti-police. And the paradox yes. is the police chiefs really supported her, like they like her, because what she's trying to do is not undermine the police, but to help them police effectively. Was, was, uh, was Cruz a dick yeah. in that? He's kind of a dick. I'm just going to sit here for a while. <laughs> what is happening right now? <laughs> keep going. Okay, we're going to keep going. Never again in person now. <laughs> this is good. Thank you. This is very good. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Nina, oh, Nina Perales. Is that how you pronounce yep. it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's uh, Texas too. She's at Malda. <laughs> And she's <laughs> Texas. Yeah. yeah. She's at Maldef and she is the book kind of ends on voting. And it ends on voting because, like I just said, one of the lessons I took is that you can win trials and win trials and win trials. And if you do not solve for vote suppression, all the stuff you and I have talked about on my other 6,000 right, right. appearances. <laughs> yeah. But like, if you don't solve for vote suppression, if you do not f- solve for gerrymandering, if you do not right. solve. That's her thing. That's her thing. So she does, she does reapportionment. She does gerrymandering. Like basically what she's constantly doing is saying like, Texas, you can't keep like packing and cracking and creating districts. And part of what she fought was putting citizenship on the census. Yes. Which they lied about. Yes, they did. They being the Trump administration. The Trump administration. Yeah. Yeah. Wilbur Ross. Yep. The Commerce Secretary. Yep. Who wanted to do that. And they wanted to do it to discourage people from. It would have discouraged minorities from answering the census because they wanted to do. If you put a citizenship question on the census, right? Uh, this apportionment is supposed to happen not based on citizenship, but based on yeah, population. You, uh, that's people need to know that that your portion is the population, not the number of voters, not the mo- number of citizens. Right. It's the population there. That's what's in the constitution. Right. And if you do it by citizens, so and the census is in the constitution. And so, when you do a census, you're supposed to get everybody. You're supposed to count the heads. Supposed and if you do heads. it by citizenship, then what you do is in jurisdictions that have high populations of minorities, high populations of immigrants, high populations of children. They're going to be afraid. They're going to be. Well, the idea was they get less, you know, services and they get less, get less right. representation. That was the obvious um, idea. That, w- that was the idea was for to scare people who weren't citizens. Right. And they could be legal. They could yep. be, but, you know, discourage them from, and, and they lied about it, of course. Of course. Right. They, they said that, uh, the Justice Department wanted this to be put onto the census, the citizenship question, uh, in order to wait for it, enforce the Voting Rights Act, <laughs> which they had not enforced. But then, yes, they just persistently lied. And, and, um, this was, I mean, just, uh, we, we talk about this, 
so much, but in this sort of effort to make it harder and harder and harder for people to vote, for people to be seen, for, you know, there and to she be. She fights a lot of gerrymandering. That's what she does. That's, that's what, what she what does. She and she's, she's also just a, another very, very fun character because this is a lot of guys do this work. Mm -hmm. And she's just like very tough, very fun, very smart. And uh, I want to meet her. Okay. She's uh, funny. Nina, call, call Al Franken. And also, I think for me, like I said, because th I wanted the book to land on where we are now, like if we don't fix one person, one vote, if we don't nope. do well, something. Well, our democracy is under assault. Now, I, I and I don't know why I did this, I, I, I skipped yeah, Kaczynski, yeah. and uh, that was something that you have personal involvement in. And this is a federal judge, kind of celebrity federal judge who sexually harassed his clerks uh he said or, or sexually an incredibly inappropriate uh, yeah. things and showed porn um and not just to his clerks to clerks from other chambers to other women and this was also the judge who had mentored brett kavanaugh brett kavanaugh had clerked for him he and had said he never saw it he didn't know about which it. everyone who was there saw it I mean, he had lists, like joke email lists of just like wildly graphic, inappropriate stuff. Um, and Kavanaugh was asked. And you had a personal experience with him. You didn't clerk for him. I didn't clerk for him. I, he, he said uh, something inappropriate to me my very first, uh, when I was just starting to clerk for another judge. And uh, I did what women do, which is I didn't report it. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I just sat on it for a very long time. And two women came forward and described what had happened to them. And I knew because everybody knew. I had been telling young women law students for years not to clerk for him. It was an open secret how he was. And I really anguished about whether or not I wanted to do this. But Two women came forward that there were several others who came forward to the Washington Post and uh, he kind of belittled them. And Article three judges serve for life. There's nothing to be done. You can't remove them. So it seemed at that time that I would have to write about it, uh, which I did. But uh, he did step down. There was no investigation. Uh, yeah, which is too bad. Which is too bad because it turns out there should be investigations. That's right. I. I you believe strongly in that principle i do i believe in due process and i believe that um but don't get me started um, yeah okay so uh and that's what anita hill says rightly of course of course that that should have been and that's biden's fault he was the chairman in in her case it was biden's fault but the thing that i love about anita hill in this book is that she doesn't want to lay blame. She just wants to fix the system. Mm -hmm. And time and time and time again, I mean, you remember this, when Christine Blasey Ford was going to go through this again, all she said was, these are the things you can do. These are the safeguards that didn't exist for me that you could put into place, not just to protect Blasey Ford, but to find the truth. If that's what this Senate proceeding is meant to do, it's not hard. And they ignored everything, you know. Well, Everything remember, uh, the, and talk about McGahn, uh, there was a FBI tip line, and for some reason, that went directly to D McGahn. It, no tip was ever followed up. And, and, and Debbie Ramirez, another person who wanted to talk to the FBI about Brett Kavanaugh, who'd had an experience at Yale uh, that she was trying to report, was not called. <laughs> she was not. I mean, it was like this wasn't an investigation. And it was, as you say, then Judge Kavanaugh walked out and said, I was exonerated. I was exculpated. Everybody, you know, this was deeply investigated and everybody came out on my side and they didn't call there were people pouring into the tip line that just essentially was a dumpster shoot. Yep. And and maybe maybe I would just say this because the point of this book was to inspire women and I think that there were moments and I again I was in the room when um Christine Blasey Ford testified where you could just 
feel palpably that women were just like, how is this happening in America? (laughs) How is this happening again? How is this woman that everybody says, everybody, including Chuck Grassley, including Donald Trump, is completely credible. I believe her. And we're all doing this and then somehow it counts for nothing. We can talk about whether that affected the midterms. I do think it did. You know, there's a lot of women organizers who are told, like, do not squawk about Kavanaugh. It's not worth it. All you're going to do is rile up, you know, Republican men. They fought, you know, a lot of the women in this book fought really hard to keep Kavanaugh off the court for reasons we can now see in the rearview mirror. But I think one of the things that I was trying to pull on in the book is that for a lot of women, this is in their bones. It's in their muscle memory. That when you have crowds chanting about Hillary Clinton, lock her up, lock her up, no charges, (laughs) no trial, just she should go to jail. And then that's expanded to Nancy Pelosi, lock her up, lock her up. And then it's Christine Blasey Ford and they're chanting, lock her up, lock her up. And nobody disputes that they think that she told the truth. For me, that's the seam that these women live on, (laughs) that they believe in the law. The law gave them equality and dignity and power. And that in a heartbeat, the law can be used to weaponize, criminalize their wombs, their bodies, their parenting. And that like right now we are seeing women locked up in Alabama who are not, you know, because the the state doesn't think that because they use drugs, they can be pregnant outside of jail. And, you know, women locked up in Oklahoma for miscarriages that seem dubious. And I just think that Women felt that coming, like they felt the hoofbeats, you know, and the ground thumping maybe a little bit more quickly that the law doesn't protect you. It's a bunch of norms. <laughs> They're pretty fragile and it can be used to hurt you. And all of the women in this book, I think, felt that coming before I did, before a lot of us did. All of them fought for it. And I think that this is a really familiar feeling when we look at these numbers like November and what's coming and, you know, women in Kansas, women in Michigan who are not going to put up with this shit, I think it's because they're not nearly as sanguine that the law is there to protect them, that it might just be there to like freaking do like what Sir Matthew Hale wanted, you know, good old fashioned witch burning mm-hmm. and that they're not going to. I'm glad. With- I'm so happy he quoted Matthew Hale. Matthew Hale, a hero to us all. This is uh, Alito. <laughs> Put him in his opinion. And yeah. He's a guy who burned witches. He was very, very pro witch pro burning. Witch, <laughs> the wor- witch burning community. Well, the book is so inspiring. And I, I want especially women to read it, but men too, obviously. But, you know, it's. What's inspiring about it is, is you can use your energies and your talent and your brains to do good stuff, <laughs> you know, to do and, and to do great stuff. And that's, I think people need to be reminded of that every once in a while. And that's what this book reminds you of. I, I took a plane ride uh, from LA to, New York, and I sat next to a guy who was a right, was a Republican, a right wing Republican. But, you know, I get along with people. You know, and so he offered me a ride back to Manhattan <laughs> from JFK. So we're sitting there and his driver is from Poland. And so I'm the, I'm the one who goes like, uh, where in Poland are you from? Are there Ukrainian refugees? There? I'm doing this. So then I go into how awful the war is and how awful Putin is and how awful Tucker Carlson is. And this guy says, well, you know, he's making a lot of money. Tucker. Oh, well, that he must be good. (laughs) And I go like, yeah, but that's not the reason to do stuff. And what's so inspiring about the book. And people should read it because it's so inspiring. And that you should do stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for writing this. And for being my friend. Oh. And for being on all the time. (laughs) Suck it, Mark Elias. (laughs) That's a good ending. (laughs) Sticks the land. (laughs) Well, I I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. 
We'll talk again next week. 